Hallo en welkom weer so by Farm Spice. Ons is hier so by saai vandag en ons gesels energie. Ek het vir Dr. Kelvin Kem hier so. Hy gaan ons meer vertel oor die nuts en bolts van hierdie. Hulle noem het die pebblewezigheid. Hy gaan nou by hom hoor exactly wat het is, hoe dit werk en sovoort. Die kort en die lang is, dit is waarschijnlijk een oplossing vir jou op jou plaas in die toekomst waar jy kan rarig ordentelike energie kry 24 uur die dag, 7 dag week en net, ja, wel, jylle moet mooi luister. Hier is baie cool, en ek dink, voordat jy die klomp batterij op die sellerplant gaan insit, luister bykie. Dr. Kelvin, how are you doing? Doing fine, thank you. Now, I'm glad to hear that. Okay, so, explain to me quickly this pebble thing that makes electricity that you are now in partnership with with Sai, but explain to me quickly, how does this work? Well, the important thing is that nuclear power contains a massive amount of energy. When you look at the amount of energy in coal, a lump of coal like this will give you a certain amount. Nuclear is millions of times more. And what we've done is we've developed a nuclear reactor that has the fuel in the shape of a cricket ball. And inside, it's a cricket ball made of graphite. Yeah. And inside the graphite are little grains of uranium, something like a chocolate chip cookie. Yes. And those grains of uranium are the things that split and let out the energy. Now, believe it or not, but half a dozen of those balls will provide all the electricity for a family of four for 10 years. A wow. lady can go and, in principle, get her handbag and bring home 10 years worth of electricity in the handbag. Of course, that wouldn't be legal, but it can be done. That's, that's crazy. And, and just out of a, I'm, I'm guessing, yeah, out of a, a safety point of view, that's why the graphite, because it's a very stable material and so forth, which you basically contain these little pocket rockets basically in there, and that, that's part of the safety component, am I correct? That's absolutely correct. The, the little grains of uranium are coated with silicon carbide and then some other coatings, like Smarties, with the coatings around them. So each piece of uranium has got its own micro coating. It's then inside the graphite ball. That's inside a metal tank of the reactor and that in turn is inside a concrete building which is the pressure vessel the containment vessel so okay. it's very well contained okay so so that's what's revolutionary about your tech is basically that it um the the alternative to that was in the olden days or what they still use as fuel is these uh, big cylinders that are, that we see in the movie am i correct yes, yes, yes. these big cylinders that you need to push in uh, there and correct dangerous first of all all these types of different components and then expensive and if you drop it it's gone yeah. where with the, the graphite balls it doesn't break you can throw a graphite ball on the floor and it'll bounce to some degree and even if one broke in half it wouldn't matter it's like breaking a chocolate chip cookie in half it doesn't really matter so from a safety point of view and an operational point of view uh, there's nothing to leak out. The other thing, which is terribly important with our technology, is we don't need a large body of water for cooling purposes. By large body, I'm talking about huge lakes, Kariba or bigger, or the ocean. Yeah. The current generation of reactors, like Kuburg type reactors around the world, have to be on the sea. So they use the seawater through the reactor for system cooling. We've designed ours to work only on helium gas, Helium gas also cannot get radioactive, it's not poisonous, it's not anything. So even if you had a hole in the side of the reactor and all the helium gas came out, it wouldn't matter. It's not going to poison you, it's not going to do anything. And apparently there's a new, there's a new source of helium gas just in the Karoo, so we sort it. Yeah, and in the, in, <laughs> in the free state they found one of the biggest deposits in the world, a company called Renogen, so we've got all the helium as well. That is awesome news. Okay, so, now in theory, okay, I can take a few cricket balls or let's say I've got a bag of cricket balls and then I can power my pivots for 10 years okay that's in theory um, okay let's come back to practice because again as I'm standing here I need to make decisions for energy on my farm going forward so we've already spoken to CS of uh, C5 capital they are happy that they've got a big enough checkbook with the consortium and enough people that's interested so that we know we've got enough money behind this okay box checked okay um now what i want to know from you is okay so what does the uh, uh, um, what does the development period look like now for it let's say today you've got all the money 
your 500-ish uh, million dollars that you need to get this thing going. What is the next steps? What does the timelines look like? And then how do I get to my little mobile unit that I want at the end? Right, well, we have developed what's called the HTMR100, which is a reactor that produces 100 megawatts of heat, which in turn will produce about 35 megawatts of electricity. We've also developed a smaller one than that called the AMR, the Advanced Micro Reactor, which produces about 10 megawatts of heat or 3.3 megawatts of electricity. And that one is designed to fit in the back of a furniture removal van and you can carry it around. So that so, would basically be like the same type of size as a big, big generator. That's yes, yes. With just the upside being that Correct. it's got 100 plus times the energy. Now, with our reactor, with uh, the SMR, it can have its own grid. There's no reason that you have to connect into a national grid. You can have an independent grid. So it's possible for our reactor to be owned by the country, the state, or a province, or a municipality, or a collection of farmers, or an agricultural grouping of some sort, or an industry such as a mine or whatever. So you can individually own them in a private manner and have your own grid. Just like you've got cell phone companies that uh, compete with each other, yep. we can have an independent grid that does not necessarily have to be collected into the country's system. So that also means... And I just want to make sure, just before we, we get that, out of a regulatory point of view, okay? Are we sorted on that front? If it's my land, I can do with it what I want? Or are there certain issues there as well? In principle, as far as electricity is concerned, if it's your land, you can do what you want. Awesome. Of course, if it's a nuclear reactor, you also have to get the license for the nuclear part. We have a nuclear regulator in South Africa, a lady by the name of Ditibopo Kormo, whom we've had discussions with. And so you would have to get a license, just like if you had poisons on your farm, or whatever the case might be, you have to be licensed to have that. So, but that would be done as a category and also depending on And what on is exactly. their attitude around this? Uh, we've had a very positive attitude from both the regulator and from the government. Yep. Whereas unfortunately some countries in the world, they've got governments that have been in opposition to nuclear Green and people. regulators have been more of an impediment they, than a help. They, they haven't had, they didn't, haven't not had electricity before, that's why they... Yes, so. yes, exactly. South Africa has been much more realistic from a government and, and legal point of view. That, that, is, that is really good news. And just coming back to you said that um, on, the, on the grid, if we've got the private grid, then what does that mean? Well, depending on who wants to own it. Uh, yeah. you know, if you look at agriculture, for example, we've been approached by the province of Limpopo, who said they're interested in getting eight reactors from us in two clusters of four, uh, linked to their special economic zones. So you could get a certain number of farmers attached. You could then get a canning plant or a processing plant attached to the farmers. You could get coal trucks that are delivering and process. So you can get an entire cluster. So it would be a case of a group of people coming together and say, if we shared out 35 uh, megawatts, for example, of electricity, let's get a group that uses all told 35 megawatts. What is the cost? They could, in principle, have their own grid and just put it together like any private operation. Or it could be linked into the national system. All that now is a case of us discussing it with the various authorities, and we've kept close with the authorities, so they're aware of these developments. Um, South Africa was the first country in the world to start developing a small modular reactor. So we really have been the bond breakers in this whole exercise. So we can be proud of what we've achieved. We're not following anybody. And what, what was the timeline? How long have you been busy with this from the inception? Well, we've been busy developing these reactors continuously now for 30 years. So we've got all that experience under our belt. But the current one, the HTML 100, we can build in five years from the moment we actually start the building. We've got people who go to work every day working on this, but it's at a low level. So as soon as the money starts to flow, we can employ more people and we can seriously plan the day on which concrete gets poured and, and so on. That's five so, years so for the that's first now, one. That's After the that, first be one. will three that... years for production models. So, so basically, and you're looking to, if everything goes well, have that thing up in, I don't know, let's say from today's date, six years, okay? If everything goes like clockwork, you get all the money in in a year's time from now and whatever, and then you start pouring and then basically five years from there, so let's say six years from now. And um, 
what is the uh, um, the development process then in terms of the smaller units and so forth or do you do that based on the learnings that you get from the the bigger one now work is going on now on the AMR as yeah. we speak the work is being done on the AMR in parallel but because we've got to focus on something we focus mainly on the SMR on the wrong thing I want <laughs> you to focus on that <laughs> no, I'm joking no, but, the, yeah. the AMR is, is quite far developed um, so if there's money flowing for the SMR, at the same time we would continue with the AMR. And of course, there would be a lot of learning on the AMR that we've learned from, from the SMR anyway. So, so I don't think Realistically, it what is the timeline um, if there's not any, um, I don't know, um, new war somewhere or whatever the case might be, or a pandemic or um, a few things, we, we live in a strange world these days. If everything goes more or less all right, what are the timelines where I'm looking, okay, cool, I can give you a check and you give me an AMR? Well, quite frankly, I would say we can probably get the AMR going in five years as well. Because if we get sufficient funds to get rolling, as you're doing a number of the things with the HTMR, um, they would overlap. So automatic development would take place. And so if we wanted to, we said, let's get the first one running in about five, then five. Okay. And um, then just in terms of, uh, um, and I, I've, I thought of a million, a million questions on, on the same time here, is I just want to get back to the safety component again. Because the little I know about nuclear is all the uh. spook stories and whatever that I've been told. Um, yes, you say it's, it's safe, but to what extent is it safe at the end of the day? Can this thing blow up? Because I also don't want a little atomic nuclear bomb here at the back of my house. Exactly. Um, how does that work? Is there any nuclear waste that comes from this thing? How's that handled, etc., etc.? Well, everybody knows about Fukushima. How many people died from nuclear radiation in Fukushima? The answer is zero. How many people were injured by nuclear radiation in Fukushima? The answer is zero. How much private property was harmed by nuclear radiation at Fukushima? Zero. There's been zero effect of radiation from Fukushima. Fukushima was a financial disaster for the owners and a PR disaster for the Japanese government and so on. But it wasn't a nuclear disaster it was an in the earthquake. sense that it, yeah, it was no different to three aircraft parked in the hangar catching fire and three aeroplanes burned down at the airport. You wouldn't call that an aviation disaster. You say the hangar burnt down and destroyed three aeroplanes. That's what happened at Fukushima. So the, the lack of safety or the danger of nuclear has been highly exaggerated over years anyway. But we have designed this SMR of ours, small modular reactor, to be walk away safe. You can literally, if the worst of the worst happens, you walk down the road, sit and have a drink and have a chat and say, well, who's going to phone the big bosses and talk to them? And the reactor will just look after itself for about a week. It'll heat up to a certain point, sit there and just gently cool itself off with no human intervention whatsoever. That is what's called now a generation four nuclear reactor, whereas um, Fukushima was a generation two. So there's been a huge advance in the science from the 1960s, 1970s, when a reactor like Fukushima was built, and now with all the electronic controls and the new materials and everything that exists today. So there's a massive difference. So I can tell you it's safe. You don't have to worry. During the operation of the reactor, there's nothing that comes out. There's no gas coming out, no water coming out, no nothing coming out, other than when you wash the teacups in the wash basin, it'll go out into the municipal. But even that is carefully tested in a nuclear reactor. At one fuel ball, when you drop it in at the top, it spends two years, two and a half years or something, slowly working its way down to the bottom. When it comes out at the bottom, you take it and you put it in storage. When that ball goes in at the top, you can hold it in your hand quite safely. When it comes out of the bottom, you daren't go near it. It's so radioactive, it'll kill you if you go anywhere near it. We know that. They then take it into storage, which means you have an underground vault and they carefully put on the shelf in rows like eggs in the, in, the, in the fridge. There's no dumping of nuclear waste. Nobody throws the stuff away. It's all very carefully looked after for years. The next step after that is a government decision. We have a, one of the oldest and largest nuclear waste repository in the world in the Northern Cape called Falpitz. Currently all 
the low-level waste goes there. That's stuff that comes out of nuclear medicine and hospitals and so on and so forth. The law hasn't decided yet what to do with the used fuel, which is called spent fuel in the nuclear business. All the spent fuel out of Kuburg is still on site after 40 years. That's how little there is. It's tiny in comparison to the ash dumps coming out of the coal stations. So we've made provision for 40 years worth of storage on a small modular reactor, our one. But long before then, the government will decide what to do, and then there will be a professional handling of the waste. Just like when the army carries military ammunition, they carry very deadly explosives, mortar bombs, artillery shells, and so on, in a professional way from one storage place to another storage place. That's what happens but with But that's not something waste. that I have to worry on a day-to-day -day basis. Absolutely not. That's literally something that one, once in every 10 years, I just need to, okay, bring the nuclear trochi that we get the stuff off of site, and then it goes and it's out of my life, and yeah. If you want to have a bra next to the fence and you watch all this taking place, you can do that. I'm 100% I'm with you. Okay, so then that piece is sorted. Okay, so if I want more information about this, because this is new and in good old South African fashion, it's just, um, as they say, necessity is the mother of all invention at the end of the day. Um, I mean, the need and everything, I think, is a lot. And we've got smart people here that... Uh, uh, um, that, that it is actually was, was figured out um, on this side. Where can I get more information about this? And um, should I look to get in, involved in the, the, the project in, let's say, a few years' time, even down the line, or even now start looking at, again, because it's, yes, eight years sounds like a long time from now, but it's when I look at solar and I look at batteries and all these things, I'm thinking in a 20-year cycle at least. And this is what you have to compare it with, with the batteries and extra solar and all of those things. Where can I get more information? Well, the first thing would be to look at our website, which is www.stratic global. Yes, Stratic let me just show you here. So that's this thing, Stratic Global, yeah. Right uh, there on the website through to the information part and somebody will process it. So that's the best. Look at the website. There's a lot of information there. And as far as your personal planning is concerned, talk to your friends. Uh, put in re request to the municipality, no matter how small it is, to say, listen, fellows, can you put it into your planning cycle? Let the municipality escalate it to the province or write directly to the province say, please, can you plan for this? And so on. So the more the people want it, the better. I've got to say, it's easier to pull wet spaghetti through a keyhole than to push it. Definitely. So if people start saying, hey, this is a South African development that we want, then the authorities will start paying a lot of attention. And we already have a lot of support from the authorities, so this will just help them along. Awesome. Galvin, thank you very much. Well done. I'm really looking forward uh, to the day that I can park that truck with the 3.3 megawatts that I'm, uh, I'm going to generate. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to be looking out for this. You're welcome. I'm sure everything's going to go well. Right, so, that is thing. That's my uh, Afrikaans, I'm going to right in place of right. Okay, right. This is Dr. Kelvin Kim from Strategic Global. Sit so many links link you for your own and all of Come on, let's talk about it. And yeah, we can have a sort of boer by each other, all the good things. I think it's rare to see something in the future. Um, so let's go and pull some of our sort of problems out. En hy het een koste oogpunt uit, yes, hy is een beetje dierder as wat jou solar waarschijnlijk is, maar jy is het met een 80 jaar leeftijd daar so, wees een solar, wel hulle sê 20, maar ons allemaal weet die in 10 jaar sy tijd nie alweer die batterijen change op. So ja, ek denk raar, dit is een baie cool ding, gaan doen een beetje huiswerk, en ons sal kyk, ons hou oog hier so een oog op die project, seker maak, die ding spoed op die helft nie. Dit is hier van Farm Space af, tot volgende keer.